stuff. Okay. <laughs> we come from, these are so much personal aspect of love. You know, seem to have flavor of personalness. Or, then you enter dimensions of love that seems to be uh, impersonal, boundless dimensions of love. You know, even though any quality of those can be infinite, you know, in the, in the absolute, but most of them feel like pearly is like, yes, I want to hug, you know, golden, I want to melt, snuggle, uh, you know, th they feel something impersonal. This seems to be like just a uh, uh, grand openness, you know, but has a lot of heartfulness in it. You know? And so one of those qualities seem to be when it awakens, it feels as if all of you is just opened up, relaxed, expanded, you know, to infinity. And it feels as if the whole universe is bathing in a loving light and a very beautiful light, as if the whole universe shining and pouring upon you, oceanic love, yeah. I remember when, when one of my experiences when I had my awakening in 76, I was meditating and I felt this whole universe is luminous, shining in, with what we call living daylight. Light upon light coming, shining and bathing me. And then it came and kissed me on the lips. I thought, oh my God, the whole universe is a kiss on the lips. And the next day, this whole oceanic love and then started showering me with rose petals. And there came days like this. I was the absolute come, luminosity, enlightened field come. Then comes, give us today our daily bread. It showered me with one thing after another. One of the things that it showered me was the living daylight. The living daylight, I was acquainted with it before I had my awakening. And it, it was one of the ways I reached it was through something called the Fisher Hoffman process. Yeah. The Fisher Hoffman process. I had the chance to learn it when I was with Claudio Naranjo and Bob Hoffman was there, the one who yeah. brought this teaching. And uh, in, in the final scene in which you burn your, so much of your karma and negativity with your parents, with yourself, mm -hmm. you utilize living daylight coming, you know, bless you. You visualize this, this oceanic of this beautiful light, you know, the whole universe shining with light, coming into your third eyes, full of unconditional love, coming through your arms. Even now, anyone who can hear, feel this invocation. It's oceanic love, bright, beautiful, loving light, gentle, loving light, coming through you, going through your arms, and we let it channel from the hands, the fingers, to all the heap of karma and negativity, and burn the karma. My karma, my mother karma. It's a beautiful process. I loved it, you know and it did a lot of healing. It really, for sure, it has its own beautiful, uh, beautiful place in, in the therapeutic field, you know? And of course, there's much more to do, but at that time, Bob Hoffman said, if you do it, this is it. You don't do any more therapy. Bless your soul. You, can, you, you need to do a lot more. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially <laughs> right after the process. <laughs> but it's a beautiful process, initiation, activation. And that was my first encounter with the living daylight, you know. Living daylight is unconditional love. It's the whole universe is bathing with sunshine love. Like that's why, like living daylight. It's light, like the, the sunlight, when you look at the window and there's light everywhere. And it feels loving. And it feels like it's God's love. God's love for all, you know. And everybody is included in it. The good, the bad, the ugly, everybody is included in it. Like the sun pours its light on, you name it, the, the rose and the animals and the trees and the humans and the criminals and the killers and it bathes. That's, it's oceanic. When you feel it, you feel oceanic love for all, unconditional love for all. It's so nourishing, it's so nurturing, and it feels oceanic. It's, it's not you. Some people th think it's God love. It is the one tsunami wave coming from the absolute. You know? That's so beautiful. It's I, really beautiful. You know, Faisal, I went, the first time I, I held my son, Stu, I don't, I don't know if I've shared this with you, but, but, but I literally felt um, sort of like gold streaming uh, 
sparkling light just all around. Yeah, it, it was almost like it, it was sort of like that. It was I was just bathed in this sparkliness yes. in holding him, yes. and it was it was just it was the most in, incredible experience. Yes, that's the oceanic love. Yeah. And it can intensify, become so sparkling, can become mellower and gentler. Yes, yes. There's something about the resiliency of the frequency. It, if the, it can be very in, bright and intense and sparkly. And if it's needed to tune down a little, it will, you know, but it feels an ocean of bright, loving light, yes. giving light, take away the darkness, the yes. fear of, about love, you know. Uh, I mean, just just so much, so much beauty to that love. So much liberating, you know, liberating from fear, liberating from hate, liberating from all negative emotions. You feel you, you your emotions become positive. You are loving instead of angry and afraid. Or you know, it's a very beautiful aspect healing. You know? So this is the living daylight. Then I remember another living daylight, you know, and the, the living daylight, of course, the issue has to do with so much uh, uh, unconditional love. How much we are living a very conditional love, you know. Our life, I love this and I don't love that. I like this and I don't like that. And it is all conditional. You know, it's not, it's not really heart openness. If the heart is open, it loves. If the heart is conditioned, I close it about this and I open it toward that. It is conditional love, it's manipulation, it's uh, limiting. So with this, it feels like you really let go of your conditioned mind, you let go of your conditioned feeling, and you just set your heart and mind and body open. How would it feel? You feel an oceanic of love. You, know, you love all. Then your heart is free. You know, Shall I love uh, this or love that? I love them all, even though some of them are schmucks and some of them are wonderful, you know? <laughs> but I, I just love them because my love, my heart loves. I have discriminating wisdom, you know, not to follow this one and follow that one and not to friend this one or not to friend that, but my heart loves. What am I gonna do? It's nature is to love, you know? Even they are so lousy, you just love them. <laughs> That's why when Christ, even in the, in the cross dying, when he reached some of that, he reached far beyond that. He said, forgive them, for they not know what they're doing. You know, it comes forgiveness here, love it. What to do? You know, you're gonna, if you're going to condition your heart to, to what is around, your heart will suffer so much. You know? I mean, I don't think anybody will be able to open their heart if you see what's around. You know? How much atrocities, how much meanness, how much, you feel like I don't want to love anybody or anything, you know? But this is, I love them all, even though they are, I'm not going to follow them. My, my heart loves. And I love the love of my heart, not the, the objects. I love that my heart could love. <laughs> you know, really, I remember one, one practice I had when my, uh, when I falling in love, the pomegranate was beginning to open in my heart. You know, I was in Kuwait, I was getting the absolute descending in my heart and opening my heart, you know, and I could feel that I was becoming so vulnerable. I fall in love from a look. I look at her, I'm in love. I see her <laughs> finger, I'm in love. You know, like when I was like a teenage, that's how it was. Then I was in Kuwait, and I don't think 78 or something. I, I came to America to visit. And I knew that the absolute hasn't landed in my heart fully. It was just beginning to open and land more love and more richness of love. And I knew that I was getting in dangerous zone. I was falling in love, you know? And somehow I had wisdom and the wisdom said, don't follow the object, mm -hmm. enjoy the feeling you're having. Yes. <laughs> you're birthing your heart, you know? And I remember I walk in Berkeley and I see this gorgeous woman and I'm madly in love. I am, I am just in love. I chase <laughs> her two, three blocks, praying that she either sees me and fall in love or she doesn't see me. She doesn't get scared. Then I go to my room in the hotel and I cry. I lost the beloved of my life. I'm so much in love with her. So <laughs> I cried an hour or two, then it's all gone. I try to remember how she looks. I don't even remember. Was she blonde? Was she dark hair? Was she, you know? Then I know 
my heart released it. Then I go again for another adventure. Three months like that. Not following the object, not getting in relationship, but I knew my heart it was getting the exercises needed. Yeah. I didn't know it was a preparation for the jeweled heart. Oh. You see, uh, the, the, that was, and I'm going, having aerobic uh, heart love exercises. Then by time my heart became stronger and stronger to have, I love this one this way and I love this one that way. How many am I gonna have of them? You know, thousand, 10,000 of them, they, they kill me coming, they kill me going, they are so beautiful. You know, I'm talking about those gorgeous women around, they, I love them. My heart got liberated and enslaved at the same time, you know? And I hope forever till I die, I hope my heart never stops falling in love. Falling in love became uh, just the, a joy of my heart, you know, mm -hmm. of my heart. But I needed to build its strength instead of, I, I fall in love with this one in a golden way. I just want to snuggle with her. This one, I want to jump her bones. This one, I want to, you know, no, I felt like I needed all those. It was such a beautiful time. I was young, I was very young at that time. So that was so much the living the light coming in the heart and the absolute descending in the heart. But then came at one time, I felt that, that living daylight was so much dominant, but started to subside. And I was, felt I was beyond it. I was, I remember one day meditating in the absolute, in the vastness and stillness and the depth of it, you know. Then I felt as if the absolute didn't come as a tsunami of uh, uh, living daylight but it came as this delicate radiance, black, delicate radiance, unfolded to infinity. Delicate, black, transparent presence. And when I felt it running through my whole system, it, it made me feel intimate with everything. And instead of being afraid, afraid of a jungle or afraid of the this kind of humans or these people or this, you know, uh, I had so many fears, you know, the alien part of my ego was afraid, you know, like, um, I don't know how Americans are. I don't know how the Chinese are. I, I grew up in a mud village. So if they are brown, I, I feel intimate. But <laughs> if they are black or if they are yellow or if they are white, I, I, my heart was like afraid. I'm exaggerating to get to give a flavor. But when this came, I felt the whole paranoia about the universe, the whole paranoia about nations and all of that got swept away. And there was this oceanic space of intimacy, intimate love. You know, that felt intimate with everything. It's not afraid of anything. You know, it's different from the unconditional love, it's intimacy, space of intimacy, you yeah? know, in which the whole universe doesn't have devils and demons, it, it's us, humanity creating messes to infinity, you know, and this is the race, you know, we are the devils and we are the angels and we are everything, you know, it feels intimacy with the humanness and their realm, intimacy with the animal realm, this is how the animals are. You don't expect them to be this, and you don't expect the tiger not to kill a deer, and you don't expect the cow not to, and that's what they do. You feel intimacy with all, and you feel the whole universe is really bathing in a field of black, transparent luminosity, and the feeling of it is intimacy, space of intimacy. And it so much took away the issues of alienation, you know? that I am different from these people and I'm this and that and these, all these, you know, like I'm, I'm a Jew, I'm special, or I am a Muslim, I'm special. You know, I'm the chosen one. All of these ideas, the belief system faded away. In this love, it's intimacy with all. A Jew or a Muslim or a Christian, they are made with the same flesh, the same human, the same constituency, you know. The, the Jew will hate the Muslim the same way a Muslim will hate the Jew. It's the same thing. They will love each other the same way. It's like, oh, this is the human race. This is the animal race. This is the tree race. A heart that felt intimate with everything, that knew everything, you know, and he knew how it works. This is how it is. I'm not afraid. Intimate with everything. And that I called it the space of intimacy, the living nightlight, 
There is the living, living daylight and conditional love, beautiful love, and the uh, living night light, night love, okay. uh, light love, which is the space of intimacy, taking away the paranoia, taking away the sense of alienation, taking away the sense that separate us as a human and separate humanity from the earth and from the ra other races, animals, trees. Or it felt like it wiped away all those boundaries, all those limitations and made me feel like we are in a kingdom, one holistic kingdom and, and we all belong to it and we belong to each other. You know, and all of these that we that separate us is our fears, you know, wait a while. And that was so soothing, so calming, so serene, you know, and took away the layer of the alien in my structure, you know, like you know, alienating from this people and that people. But I remember in that, this is where the punchline come about this whole teaching. I remember I was enjoying it, taken by it. But I know something about me. I am not satisfied till I find the source. You know? I said, where is this space? Where is this intimacy coming from? Is it just an ocean from the absolute? One of the oceanic aspects of the absolute, living daylight, um, living nightlight, or is there something there that's making this happen? I was asking for blasphemous questions. If I was religious, I say, oh, thank you, God, for this, you know, hallelujah. But this devil in me, thanks to this devil, you know, in me, it's like devil and tufil in Arabic, the same word, which means child. Child. The devil is a child within. Defiant, rebellion, three years old, <laughs> curious. You know, so I said, okay, let me look. And in the depth of meditation, after some time, you know, being in this field, I felt as if was pulled, as if something was pulling me from my heart, from the center of my being, from my soul, to the center of the universe, as if I was cruising beyond not only the material, but also all the essential domain, riding this space of intimacy. And there in the midst of this immensity and this oceanic emanation of space of intimacy, there was this temple, what the Jews are trying to do, the temple, the jeweled temple. There was a huge structure, a spaceship, in the midst of the absolute, emanating infinite oceanic love. It was what we call the stupa. See it behind me, on top. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. That's that's the form of it. The the Christians have the steeple in the church. The Buddhists have a stupa. The Muslims have minarets. It's a symbol, universal symbol of a structure, divine structure, you know. And that divine structure has the ability. It's made of ju different jewels. It was a huge temple in the midst of the universe jewels, beautiful jewels, you know, different color jewels. It wasn't diamond, you know, I remember with Almas, you know, he called it the diamond heart. The diamond heart, this is also a message for the school, student, the school. The diamond heart is only one manifestation of the jeweled heart. Okay. The jeweled heart has diamondness quality, has crystal qualities, has amethyst, has pearliness, has goldenness. The super is made of all kind of gradations and structures. So I call it the jeweled heart. Okay. The diamond heart, if I am a five, I would like the diamond dimensions and I try to limit everything in the diamond dimension. <laughs> you know? And if I am a, a two, I love light and I make everything light. I will see light stupa, light thousand winged angel. You know, But I try to see it for just what it is, the suchness of what it is. And it appeared to me this immense jewel structure made of light, condensed light. Each jewel, whether amethyst or diamond or pearl, or, uh, is a condensation of a frequency of love. The ruby in it was emanating pomegranate oceanic love. The green in it was emanating infinite ocean of green 
tender love. The yellow was emanating infinite ocean of joyous love. So every jewel in the sacred structure was transforming the absolute into oceanic aspect of love. That is the heart of enlightenment. That's what Buddha called after Buddha had his realization of enlightenment and after he stabilized in the absolute and the enlightened nature, he descended from mind, from conscious to heart. Which by is the heart of enlightenment. After Buddha realized the absolute, Buddha nature, the nature of mind, he descended with the absolute into heart. The heart awakened. They say that the heart, the electromagnetic field actually of the heart is I think 40 or 60 times more than the brain. Yeah. And I think somebody said 4,000 to 6,000 more. So this is a giant electromagnetic field here in the heart. It takes the absolute and differentiate it into emanations of love. That vehicle that differentiate the absolute into infinite emanations of love is the jeweled heart, is the heart of enlightenment, symbolized by the sofa or the cathedral or the church or, you know, or um, the mosque or the temples or all of those things. That was when I really encountered the complete heart, the jeweled heart. Mm. That this heart has so much in it, it's, the, it's God's heart. I said, I want this heart, you teach me, you download it, you know. You say, and it has been abundant, one quality after. Then I visited all the essential states, but from a heart place. And I discovered white essence, even though it is will, it is a form of love. It is stabilizing love. Black essence, even though it's peace, it is peaceful love. Diamond is, is conscious love. They all, as if the heart started to color everything with heartfulness. They say, oh, God must have been a lover. <laughs> he must have fallen in love with her so much, he created everything as a symphony of love. This perception, you cannot see the beauty and the music of it and the art of it and the science of it and all of that till you open your heart to the richness. And the heart will include the belly, include the mind, and include the totality. The stupa is the body of the totality. And it is the temple of the soul. In the stupa, when I got closer in my journeying, you know, in that night to the heart of the absolute, I reached the stupa and in the stupa, there was an entity. They always put the stupa, the Tibetan, with a window in the middle of it. And in the window, they put a little Buddha, you know, there. The little Buddha is an entity, a soul, and that's a point of light. Every one of us is made of this jewel temple, swing low, sweet chariot, sweet chariot, take me home. This is the sweet chariot that generate from the absolute sweetnesses and love is the stupa chandelier uh, vehicle. It's a vehicle made of diamonds and jewels, but made of light diamonds. They're, they're, they're from a different realm, you know, realm of light, realm, not of the physical light, but a subtler light, essential light coming from source. You know? Some Maybe someday I elaborate more on that, you know. Please. <laughs> on the mechanism of that, you know. But it is made of jewels and they shine with light. The whole vehicle illuminate the darkness of the void. And it transforms the infinite field of voidness into infinite emanations of love, of intimacy, of belonging, of creativity. That's the jewel heart. That's the heart that uh, gestalt all the qualities with heartfulness, and inside that temple, there was an entity. We are like this. We are a jewel temple centralized in the heart. Think of the heart, the chest, as the throne room, studded with so many. On the left side, there are yellow love and green, and green in the middle, and red in the right, and blue in the throat, and aquamarine and turquoise and white. This is a throne room. 
the room where the room where the throne of the king or the queen is and inside this jeweled room shining with jewels and lights when it's really open when it's really cleansed there is a seat a throne and in that throne sitting the beloved the point of light what we call the point of light each one of what each one of us is created in the image of god or goddess we are precious, beautiful being. That's why you always see the Tibetan make Tara, this beautiful, gorgeous princess with jewels sitting in a lotus throne. Mm -hmm. Art is a lotus throne. And um, I don't know, I've looked at Shvara with or all of those high beings. They are all beautiful souls wearing their crowns, jewels, ornaments. Their center place is in the heart. Now, why did God or goddess choose the heart? Because mind can produce infinite conceptual and ideas infinitely, but it might not know the purpose. Why should it? It could just create. It could just make ideas and belief system never end. You can differentiate the absolute into infinity. You know? Then the mind could lose its purpose. You know, it really can become an, an, an immense field of intellectuality no beginning, no end, or infinite field of scientific speculations or, or things like that. Um, the belly, the same thing. The belly is a center that can generate solidity, consolidation. It can create infinite universes. You can create one material after another, one uh, home after another, one car after another, never end. So this center can be excessive. This center can be excessive. The heart is where equanimity can resist, uh, persist. There in the heart is the heart dweller. And the heart dweller is navigating the mind and the will. When the, when the heart open and the beloved sitting in the throne, it can tell you how much you need to use your mind. You don't need to use it all the time. Certain things you need to use it for. Other things, let it be peaceful, let it be shining, let it be luminous. You don't have to go and do and do and do and do like, you know, we, you see it how in America we are consuming nation. We are depleting our resources with, you know, we don't need so much plastic. We don't need so much, but it, we can do it and we do it. With the heart, we balance mind and belly. That's why God chose the center of balancing. Mind is to be balanced, otherwise to become excessive materializing or will can be excessive, but heart can balance the two and can create harmonious kingdom, harmonious human being. So this is the journey of the heart, the love of the heart, the beauty of the heart, what it can, uh, I mean, it's amazing. I can't talk about it forever, but there is one love I haven't mentioned, which is not part of any of these loves. These are all accessible for us by our work, by our undoing our issues and all of those things. There is a love I, I, I had the grace of experiencing to be touched by it and it transformed my life forever. It transformed my life, it transformed, transformed the teaching and tr transformed my perception of the unfoldment of the diamond approach. You know, I was part of it, unfolding it, but when I felt it was deviated, I was taken out of it. But you are still there doing it. Enlightened, but that's not enough. Absolutely not enough. You know? There was a love that I had to let go of my enlightenment. I had to let go of the diamond approach. I had to let go of all knowledges. And I had to throw myself in an abyss, knowing that all of them touched me, transformed me, but didn't transform me, it transformed so much about me, but I remained in anguish. Mm. And I was chasing, I didn't deal with this issue, I didn't deal with that issue. My mother, my father, uh, school, there's, like I could see, I see I could be lost in the mind and transparent and object relational field to infinity. And I said, no, that's enough. That's not the way. I will never figure out all the issues of existence and I think that's the pitfall of Rodwan. They try to figure out all the issues in existence. Has no end. It's like quicksand. 
the more you move, the more you create issues. <laughs> the more you know, never end. You know, I felt, no, I was the dilemma. I could dissolve, but I still resurrect. I could dissolve in the absolute, and I still come up. You know? And reaching that level, reaching that I am the obstacle, and no matter how much work I do, I won't be absolve of me because I cannot undo me. Any doing, any undoing of me perpetuate me. Yeah. You see, any undoing, even dissolving me in the absolute, still there was a minute effort of letting me letting go. And this minute effort is like a little hidden seed. And after I go in the absolute for so long, I resurrect again. And this voice says, how about me? I am still here. Right, right, and right, of course. <laughs> yeah, yes, and I said, oh, bad ego, you're still here, you know? And I said, no, what if this is not my ego? This, what if it's my soul? You know? It's not ego. The, the ego is even speaking what my soul was feeling. Mm -hmm. So I dropped everything and landed for about a year in the dark night of the soul. And I talked about it in one of the videos mm -hmm. about the dimensions of love. And there when I felt divine love, divine interference, divine emanation of a love, that there was no way I could give it to me. There was a holder of that emanation of love. And there was this whole dimension of this divine love, but there was a ruler to it. There was a generator of it. There was someone who was way ahead of me and everyone I know in existence, at least that I met, you know, and I met many. Karmapas, Dalai Lamas, uh, high beings. They were like teenagers compared to where he is spiritually. And that entity showed up. You know, when I really realized I am the obstacle and there is no way I could undo me and I will fight any healing of me because I, I didn't know anything else but to fight. I am resistance itself. I resist, therefore I am. You know? And then grace come and a touch of this love. I, I only call it divine love. I cannot transmit it. I can't feel it. I can't transmit it. It won't do because it is between every soul and the divine one or between us and God. Everyone on us deep inside is angry, not at mother, not at father, is disappointed, not at mother at, and at father, and wounded, not by mother and father. All of that is true, but there is the big kahuna, <laughs> the one who is responsible for all, the one who is worthy of all our rage and all of our resentment and all rejection and all of our prayers and all of our appeal, you know, pleading. Amazing, amazing pa paradox of feelings. You know, when we ad oh, when I admitted to it, I felt now I reach a humility that's full of pride, full of dignity. Mm. I am, Omar Khayyam says, I am your defiant servant. I defy you. I don't give a damn. I'm, I can't do without you. <laughs> but please don't go. <laughs> when I reach this level, broken but dignified, and the true honesty and true truth to the divine, do you exist God, is there God? Then that when this divine entity bestowed upon me its presence and its love and it was the most gentle, the most sublime, the highest frequency of all the loves. Mm. Living daylight seems to be like, yeah, wonderful, but it's like a bulldozer. This is like a gentle flame because it touches the most gentle wound in the human soul. Mm. Feeling we all feel, we all feel deep inside forsaken by God. Why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? I could understand my mother forsake me, my father forsake me, they cannot help it. But you supposed to be all love, how could you? What did I do? When I reached that and I felt that healing, that was the deepest healing of, you know, I said pomegranate or, uh, magenta heals narcissistic wound in the ego. This heals narcissistic wound in the soul itself. You know that I am wounded and I'm gonna do it without you. But I am I am really wounded by you. you know, I'm really this my personal 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 wound. When that love came, it changed everything in my life. That's divine love. 
this entity, you know, often known as the Christ or Lord Divine, or I don't know, it's, it's way beyond all the dimensions of love. The vehicle of the stupa is, is his temple, you know, it's bathing in divine love, his emanation. Ours is bathing with all kinds of loves and all kinds of emanation, but we are created in the image of that entity and we separated, you know, and in the separation, we've forgotten. It's like a child crying day and night, but forgotten what's it about, till he sees mother. I say, oh, I've been crying about you. Mm -hmm. I've been raging and waging wars about you, for you. Mm -hmm. We all forgotten that, except very few. And every now and then I hear or I meet somebody who had similar experience of divine love. And it is, it is so humbling, so beautiful. I remember I, I said it like every bone in me bowed to this emanation, this phenoid, as if I had a cranium, sacral, sacrum, phenoid bowed, every vertebrae bowed with reverence, with love, with the beauty, not with fear, not with greed, not wanting anything. You just love for the sake of love. You know, it's so beautiful. And from then on, I, this is where I want to land. I want to continue my landing with knowledges and wisdom and efficiencies and learning and inquiries and messes, you know, but it's motivated by heartfulness. Mm. Yeah? And if we mess, please rush back, massage your chest, dig between your ribs, uh, sigh, especially, ah, oh, H-A, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. You know, um, laugh, listen to some jokes and laugh, you know, uh, cry, do some breathing and cry, watch an Indian movie and cry, <laughs> melt your heart, soften, what is waiting is beyond any imagination we can think of, beauty beyond anything, King Solomon treasures, kingdom, that is so beautiful, but we need the Maserati to cruise in it. The stupa <laughs> to land in it, the jeweled heart, you know? So the point of light, and instead of riding the old clunker of the personality, structure, and ego, ride in clarity and precision and grace and beauty with the gratitude for sound and colors and light and music and uh, sensation, a, a, a symphony here, a majesty here. But it can be integrated in the integrative center. The mind is the differentiative center. You know, when I lived, left the school, we were in never-ending differentiation. Differentiate and differentiate and differentiate. This quality, that quality, this quality. And when I left, I went into integration. They, all the qualities gel together into the jeweled heart. Then a grand symphony opened up. And instead of me dissecting and analyzing and dissecting, and analyzing, that's good, you know. That's if somebody want to be a specialist that way, fine, you know. But not everybody want to be specialists. We want to live the kingdom. We want to walk around saying glory, glory, you know. Really, praise the Lord, praise us, praise all that there is. This is heart mystery, really. So I hope this transmission of heart, the beauty of it, the richness of it is so beautiful. You become heart dweller, which we are anyway. So extraordinary. Thank you, Faisal.